Chris here this evening to be our speaker, and Ruth is in our electrical engineering department. Uh, she works both with uh, wind energy and solar energy, and we've already had a talk on wind energy, so uh, tonight uh, she's going to talk to us about solar energy. This is becoming increasingly important as we towards uh, renewable and sustainable energy, and so we're happy to have you here, and thank you for coming. Thanks, Larry. What I want to do is give you a little bit of a review or uh, explanation of a little bit of the, the physics of photovoltaics, and then a very brief outline of how you would go about designing a photovoltaic system. One of the things that I didn't put in here except as a brief mention is solar thermal, where you use the sun to make something hot and then use that hot stuff to do something. I'll talk about it a little bit, but the physics is what I opted to concentrate on here. Um, you have, that's probably, I don't know for sure, uh, an array in Arizona. And this is at Medicine Hat College in uh, Canada. Um, last staging day for the solar car race in 2005. Well, you've had a lot of talking already about what different kinds of alternative and renewable energies there are. Uh, Non-renewable alternative energies include things like oil shells and oil shale and DC methane, things that we could maybe get at that would produce energy but aren't renewable, and nuclear fits in there. Though um, it's not renewable, we could still make use of it for a very long time. The renewable energies that mostly matter are geothermal, use of the Earth's heat for something, wind, which you've already heard about, hydrologic water dams, and solar. And all of them have problems because they don't all work everywhere. The sun doesn't shine everywhere. The wind doesn't blow everywhere. And, and non, none of them is perfect, but a collection of the set all together is uh, probably going to be uh, the solution to energy problems. I'm sorry? Uh, that, that we would call renewable, I think. I'm not, not saying, oh, tide would be one that isn't there. Uh, not saying that we can't do it, we just haven't got down yet. And some other uh, more curious ones that we haven't, we could put a lot more work into before we're, we're ready to use them. Okay. Solar energy uh, has been growing in demand at such a rate that you simply couldn't buy solar panels very easily last year, and I'm not sure you can even get them this year. However, uh, I went looking for up-to-date information on solar demand, and there was a, a conference just held this September where they're prophesying that within two years, the annual supply will exceed demand by quite a bit, which is good news because it'll bring the prices down. Uh, the retail cost from our local Folks who uh, do this for a living, the uh, Sunrites who put the solar array on UFM, it's 8 to $10 a watt for a grid-connected system. You're not paying for batteries. That's the capital cost. That's the installation cost. Yeah. So the cost of the, the, the system and getting it done, put in. Right. Um, so if you need, that's a three kilowatt array, you can kind of figure it costs about $30,000. Um, cost parity, solar power over the long term costs about 10 cents a kilowatt hour if you're saying you're going to run this for 20 years. In Kansas, right now, in West Star Territory, we pay about 8 cents a kilowatt hour retail. That's going up. It's going up by probably 11 percent. I think that's settled here. There are some places in Kansas where electricity rates are over 10 cents, where they're 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And there are a lot of places in the world where electricity is a lot higher than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're sort of on the cusp of solar power at current rates being uh, cost effective um, without any additional incentives. A solar array produces electricity for at least 20 years. In fact, if it's still going after 20 years, you've got a good chance that it'll last 40 years. It doesn't produce any carbon dioxide, no nitrous oxides, no noise, never needs refueling. So once you've got it in, you're, you're free 
from there on out. Okay. Uh, semiconductors are magic. It really is pretty cool the way they work. Essentially, we've got a way based on the physics of these particular materials to convert solar photons into energy. It has to do only with the chemistry as a material that this works. Uh, we need to find a way, if the energy is sufficient to excite electrons, we then just have to figure out a way to get those electrons to go in one direction so we've got a uniform current. Uh, I'm a big Heinlein fan. He wrote a lot of science fiction in the 50s, and I read them in the 80s. Um, and he coined this tan staffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, you don't get something for nothing. So it looks free. If I give you this solar panel, it'll produce energy for free from there on out. It is expensive and difficult to do, and it can be a very messy process. But, uh, of course, once it's done, they last for a very long time. Okay, so imagine this is your semiconductor crystal. Each star is an atom. Each atom has so many electrons that it holds close to itself, and then some in its outer shell with which it makes bonds. In a semiconductor, those bonds are covalent. So the electron is freely shared between the two atoms and pretty tightly held. If a photon impinges on the semiconductor, and it hits an electron in this covalent bond. The nature of a semiconductor is what makes it a semiconductor. The energy in that bond is about the same as the energy in a photon, in an ordinary optical light, visible light photon. So if the electron absorbs that energy, it is then excited enough to break the bond. It leaves behind a hole, which electrically, I know this is weird, but it acts like a positive charge. So you've got an electron hole pair that are produced, and they will immediately move apart from each other because of their signs, but they could go any which way. So I can shine light on this. I'll see lots of electrons and holes, and they'll scatter, and they'll recombine. The electrons will fall back into the holes, and, and I haven't made any electricity or power per se. So what we do is we take the same semiconductor crystal and replace some small percentage of the atoms on one side with atoms that have one less electron and one less proton. So they can't make all four bonds with their neighbors. And on the other side, we replace a, some small number of the atoms with atoms that have one extra electron and one extra proton. So there's an electron over here that can't bond. There's no place to bond to. The electrons over here then gradually migrate just by diffusion, uh, that is just moving down a concentration gradient. Um, imagine drops of dye in water, and they'll gradually spread out very slowly to the rest of the water. And they come over here and they discover that there are bonds that are not filled. So they'll fall down into those bonds. So now this side has all covalent bonds with everything, and so does that side. But these had one extra proton, so now they're positively charged. These had one less proton, they've gained an electron, so now they're negatively charged. The overall effect is a big electric field. It's plus over here, it's minus over here, it looks like a battery. When now the photon hits one of these electrons, then, and gets excited, the electron pops out of the bond, now it finds itself in the middle of this electric field, it sees negatives over here, positives over there, and it heads out that way. The hole goes the other way, and I actually have current. And that's all it takes. That's all that photovoltaics is. It's simply produced using chemistry, a voltage difference. Yeah? Uh, wouldn't that be like so side side instead of concentration gradient? Would it be like uh, just minimizing the energy? Yes. Yes, you can argue that, that, that forming this, this voltage is, an, is a minimizing of energy. Yeah. It is a constant. They, when you first dope it, you have a lot of electrons over here and a lot of holes over here. The electrons move down a concentration gradient. And that is the same as minimizing energy, but both languages work. Okay? Does that help? 
All right, so here's a picture of the same kind of thing. Now I've got the, uh, the pink stuff is n-type, so has, uh, would have had extra electrons, and now it's positively charged. The green stuff is p-type, so it is negatively charged. When the sun hits one of the bound electrons in this region and knocks it free, it will head up towards what would be the, the positive charges in the n-type region, and you get a current, and the arrows here, this was drawn by a physicist, this current is uh, opposite of the current that we typically measure. You would, you would say that positive current flows from the top down to the bottom. So all solar cells have some separate metals to collect that current once you start it. This one has metal on top and metal on the bottom. One of the more efficient silicon versions that you can buy these days puts both sets of metal on the bottom and interleaves them like a comb. They don't touch, but you have this effective comb. So when the electrons hit, they go, come from one of those uh, tines of the comb across the semiconductor and into the other one. All right. So that because we have this diode junction, it has no free charges in it, at least to start with. When the sun hits, it knocks the electron free. It's free to conduct. It sees it's in an electric field. It goes out in one direction. So then the next question is, all right, well, that sounds just like magic. That's terrific. If every photon does that, I must get an awful lot of energy out of the sun. The problem is that the photon doesn't have to be absorbed by an electron. If a photon is too high energy, say too blue, it could go straight through and not hit any electrons. If it's too red, then although it might get absorbed by an electron, it just makes it warm, but it doesn't break the bond. So there's a preferential region where the uh, photons are neither too excited nor too slow so that they actually work. And that depends on the chemistry. What is the energy in that bond that I'm going to break? Uh, solar cells that you can buy include amorphous silicon. This is amorphous. This is Union's shingle. Looks like it's for putting on a roof. It looks and feels like asphalt tile, asphalt shingle, but it's actually solar stuff. Instead of being pure crystal, it's amorphous. Because it's amorphous, once you free an electron, there are more things for it to run into. You don't have this nice, neat, regular cage for it, you to imagine it running through. Um, a difference between running down the center aisle of this room and running through a room full of a lot of people. And that increases resistance and increase, decreases efficiency. So that runs between 5 and 10 percent efficient. Um, and it costs about $9 a watt. That's to install. Okay? So to buy it and install it. Raw, it probably is closer to 3. You just want the, the stuff without uh, having any packaging. Polycrystalline silicon is pretty common these days in things like traffic signs, the blinky signs on the highway down here with the panel on top. If they look like they're broken. If you look at the surface, it looks like it's all cracked. And that's because instead of being one uniform crystal, it's many small pieces of crystal that are out of alignment. The edges of the crystal form a place that's inefficient. So they are in the same range as amorphous cells. Monocrystalline silicon, you grow one single crystal. Think about a huge diamond, except it's silicon. And then you cut it. And that, uh, the best we've got marketing these days is 20% efficient. And any of those, once you buy them and put them on the roof, end up costing about the same amount per watt. Cells that you put on satellites <coughs> in space have uh, efficiencies up near 30 percent. We think the theoretical maximum for semiconductors in general is 50 percent. Um, the maximum that NREL has reported with anything experimental it was 42 recently, and that was in the lab. So a very carefully defined, tame light source rather than the sun. And the best they've done with amorphous stuff isn't silicon. It's um, 
I don't want to say indium nitride, but that's not right. It's like copper indium sulfate or something like that. Uh, and it was 14%. And when people talk about the solar breakthrough, that suddenly everything is going to be really cheap, it's the idea that we can come up with this amorphous material that we could paint on uh, or, or, or spray on that would be an efficiency in the 14% range. And that would, that would just be a dream. But I think it's, it's a doable thing. It just hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, Space-grade cells that go on satellites cost $100 a watt and more, and they're very hard to get a hold of. Yes? Could you just put a bunch of those on each other so that way? Well, the trouble is, once the sun's gone through, there's not much left. Remember, the, the problem isn't that the photons uh, miss, they, that some of it, but mostly the problem is the photons aren't the right energy. So what we do with, this is what multi-junction means, you take different semiconductor materials whose bond energies are different. So they'll absorb different uh, energy of photons. And you can layer them up to three, I've even heard of five layers. So the one absorbs the highest uh, energy photons, the blue ones, and then one for the green, and then one for the yellow, and then one for the red. Um, if you run current backwards through a solar cell, not silicon, but for anything else, it glows, and we call it a photodiode. So when you see a blue LED, right, that same physics, that same material, would convert blue light into electricity. So we have materials that will convert these different lights, but they're very expensive to make. Multiple layers have other, a lot of other problems. That's where that 50% theoretical comes in. So most layers we could stack up and uh, convert almost all the photons within the sun's most high energy spectrum. And our sun, this is, hopefully doesn't seem strange, most of the energy that our sun puts out is in the range of light that we see. And it's really the other way around. We evolved to see the light the energy puts, the sun puts out. So it's a little bit of UV, and then mostly the, the peak is in the yellow, and then uh, uh, down in the, in the IR. Silicon absorbs from yellow on down to IR, and gallium arsenide can go on up to a, a UV peak. Okay. This is the multiple junctions. You get multiple layers. And you can absorb photons at different crystals, at different uh, wavelengths. It's more expensive to make. Obviously, this is pretty tedious to do that. You do it by cooking the stuff in an oven with the right gases, and the gases deposit on the crystal. A monocrystalline structure is very, very fragile. We have some raw cells for the solar car downstairs. The gallium arsenide cells are the thinner than a cover slip. And they are glass, and most cover slips are plastic. They break extremely easily. Okay. Amorphous materials can be flexible, can be pretty tough. Uh, you can bend that um, stuff for putting on houses, and, and it'll put up with quite a bit. Even multi-crystalline structures can be coated with a plastic to make them pretty rugged. Uh, I had a friend bring in. He was very sad the solar panel that had been on his RV that blew off the RV while he was working on it, landed in the pasture next to the road. Before he could get down the RV and over the fence, the cows stepped on it. Solar panels do not survive cows very well. They're built to put up with a fair amount of hail, but a cow is kind of a bit much. So it had this huge crack in it, just spider web all over. But it still works because it's, it's, it's um, multicrystalline, it's kind of broken anyway. It's not as efficient as it was, but it does still work. They're pretty tough. All right, so that's the cell. Mostly, you're going to go buy that cell. If you want to build a system, you're going to buy the cell already in a package, what was called a module. That package then has to be connected to a charge controller. Its job is to hold the voltage of the array at that point which produces the most power. Okay? If at one voltage it will produce no current at all, and at another voltage it will produce 
uh, well, at zero voltage, it'll produce lots of current, but you need the product, the voltage times the current, to be a maximum. So this is a, a DC converter that will figure out with a computer the best voltage to hold the cell at for any given sun. On the other side, it's figuring out what voltage do I have to put out to feed the battery. Because it won't feed the battery if the voltage is not higher than the battery is. So it has that job if you have a battery in the system. That gives you DC power that you're storing in the DC energy in the battery. But if you want to actually run things in most ordinary houses, you need AC electricity, so you need an inverter that turns the DC into the AC stuff we're used to. You can omit the battery altogether and go straight from charge controller to inverter, and that works just fine. Okay. Um, if you do use a battery system, or even without, you can go straight to DC loads. So you could run, say, lights that are LEDs. Uh, or uh, DC refrigerators if you're working off-grid. Okay. So those are all the pieces you have to get. And these days, with solar systems, you have to buy all those pieces individually. So you're going to go to a dealer, perhaps, and say, I want you know, three kilowatt array. You've got to figure out which charge controller do you want, which inverter, or how many, and which panels. You have to, to pick all those pieces separately. Uh, as far as long lividness, the battery is going to die most quickly. You probably have to replace those every eight to ten years. The replacements on the charge controller and the inverter may be more than that. It very much depends because those are electronics and they may work just fine for 20 years or suddenly you may lose uh, a transistor and have to, to get a new one. So those probably will be replaced at least once during the lifetime of the panels. You won't need to replace the panel at all. The worst that's going to happen is the coating over it will turn a bit yellow. And that's called derating. And that's figured in. The manufacturer will tell you the power loss derating after so many years. Okay. Different ways you can apply the whole system. There's sort of three scales. You can build a whole power plant out of solar cells. I know there is one running in Arizona. There are a lot running in Germany. I've actually seen them. This one is from uh, uh, Bavaria, and I have seen similar ones. And Spain has many as well. Uh, obviously, this takes up a lot of land area. In the US, Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California are good places for those. Uh, there's been a lot of press about Google buying one or putting one on roofs, that kind of thing, if you had a big roof. But this is obviously a very large area. Is that power pretty much used as generated as opposed to stored in some batteries somewhere? Yes. Uh, we do not have large-scale commercial storage, period. So when a utility does this, it has to be prepared with some other energy source in the, at nighttime or cloudy days. Some of the largest arrays are in Germany. Germany's latitude is about equal with New England, or even further north. Uh, they don't get much sun, but they have very expensive electricity, so it's worth it to do this. They pay the owners of cell arrays like this 50 cents a kilowatt hour, which would be wonderful to do that. Next scale, <coughs> excuse me, would be residential. And I collected a bunch of just examples off the National Renewable Energy Lab website. And you can see these are sort of the, the ones you're used to. These would be monocrystalline cells in an array that goes on top of the roof on a rack. This is the shingle type. And I think that is also. Okay. So you put enough panels on your home if your roof points the right way to meet the needs of the home or some portion of them and maybe it also charges your car. The other place solar panels work really well is in remote applications. Uh, this is on Canadian Highway Route 1 and I think we all thought it was pretty good. Um, solar car, solar panel, solar sign. Um, the sign is in the middle of nowhere. They, don't, they can move it around, and they don't have to worry about plugging it in. 
because it powers itself. In this system, there would be a battery. And you do see these in places in Kansas. Other places they work is in a rural well pump. If you want to pump water. Uh, on a boat, obviously, you can't plug it in, so it works really well. And on a boat, you usually have a battery and do everything in DC, skip the inverter. Uh, street lighting, and most of you have seen the little lights that you can buy now to put in, in your yard that, that have solar panels, LEDs, and their own battery, and do everything internally. One thing that you might not think of that works really well for solar stuff, anything metal buried in the ground is an electrode. Especially if the ground is at all moist, the natural difference between the metal and the ground will generally run a current and corrode that metal and rust it. If that metal is, say, a gasoline tank and you corrode it till it leaks, that's pretty bad. So you can fix that by applying a voltage, running a small current the wrong way all the time. It doesn't have to be a very big current, so it's an ideal application for solar panels. One of the places where solar cells really, we're not going to see this kind of thing commercially, I'm afraid. And I'll explain why. This, by the way, is Paragon. If you take sort of your typical car and put 20% efficient silicon solar cells on there, so the highest efficiency you can get for the size of the roof, then the nature of the size of the roof says you can make about 20 watt times for however long the sun, the car sits in the sun. So if it sits in, an hour, in the sun for an hour, that's 20 watt hours of electricity that it's made while sitting parked. To give you an idea of what you can do with that energy, I have a Prius. Priuses generate electricity when you brake, when you stop or slow down or coast. And when I'm driving around Manhattan, and there's lots of stop signs, I generate between 100 and 150 watt hours of energy every five minutes. So it's going to take me an hour to generate 200 watt hours, or I can do it in 10 minutes just trying to stop the car. So 200 watt hours is just not a lot of energy for a 2,000 ton car, a 2,000 pound car, excuse me. On the other hand, if you take an electric car, you make it weigh 500 pounds instead of 1,000, or 1,000 pounds instead of 2,000, equip it with some decent batteries, um, lithium ion would be a good choice, put solar panels on your house, then you can have the solar panels charge a battery bank, and then uh, overnight you can exchange the battery power, battery tanks, and uh, it is quite feasible now. We have the technology to get 300 mile range if you're willing to put up with a car that doesn't weigh a ton, which is a fairly big thing. So your standard curb side car weighs a ton. So you've got to make it weigh less so that it can go further on less energy. Uh, this thing is a, a GEM, G-E-M. It's a Chrysler electric car. It, uh, it doesn't weigh a ton, but it doesn't weigh a lot less. Its maximum speed is 30 miles an hour, and its running run time is about 30 minutes. Um, you can do better than that. It runs on lead-acid batteries. OK, well, suppose you want to design a solar system. And in particular, let's put it on a house, because we're not going to go too well putting it on a car. So some of the things you need to know. How much energy do you need? How much power do you need at peak? Where are you? What kind of sun can you count on during the course of a, of a day or a year? Do you want this to look like solar panels, or would you rather have it look like an ordinary roof? That's what building integrated means. Uh, do you want to be able to move those panels so they track the sun? You'll get more efficiency that way, but it'll make for a more complicated, more expensive installation. Do you want to have the grid there? to turn on the lights on cloudy days or at night? Or do you want a system that stands by itself so it stores some energy? And then uh, solar panels get hot because those f photons that they can't turn into energy, they turn into heat. Um, and the hotter they are, the less efficient they are. So one thing you could consider is would you like some system of, say, water pipes on the backs of your panels to pull that heat off? 
and used to say heat water or something like that. <coughs> if you're connected to the grid, then you have the utility to back you up if the sun fails, so you don't need batteries. However, there's some things you have to do. You have to synchronize your signal, your AC signal, with the grid somehow. Inverters will do that for you. It's not hard. Uh, you have to worry about the power factor that it is the uh, difference in the cycle between the voltage and the current that you're making. Again, the inverter has to do that for you. If you don't, the power company gets mad. And you have to worry about whether your generating system could send electricity back onto the grid when the grid is down. So you can imagine during the ice storm, we did have some pretty sunny days. You went up on your roof, you cleared the snow off your solar panels, you wanted that to feed your house. If you had that connected as it would normally be to the lines, when the linemen came to fix those lines thinking they are dead, they would not be dead. Uh, they would be live and you could easily electrocute somebody. So it's a, a standard rule and requirement that if you have a power outage, you can disconnect your generator from the transmission. In fact, it must disconnect automatically. Okay. Um, you can do a little bit of both. Once you've figured out what uh, your generation needs are, you could ask, well, could I use both solar and wind? Sometimes that works really well. In California, in particular, there's a lot of wind at night. In Kansas, we don't have quite that much luck. They don't synchronize very well. Um, both need a fair amount of area, either on the roof or in a field where you can put up your wind turbines. Wind needs height and open space, so you don't need trees get in the way, and you need a big yard. Um, Solar needs open space. Trees that shade it will ruin it, but you don't need the height. In some places, you can get good sun but not good wind, or vice versa. Uh, in Kansas, obviously, you get really good sun in the summer when the wind is down a little bit. And we get pretty good wind in the winter when the sun is down a little bit. So it, it does overlap some and fit well. Okay, so you've decided you really want a solar system. Your first step isn't deciding which solar panel to use. It's cutting your demand. It is critical whenever we do anything with renewable energy to first think, well, how do I use less energy to start with? Because that's the cheapest energy you can buy, con conserving it. So first, you replace all your lights with fluorescence. And second, you turn them off when you don't use them. A programmable thermostat is probably the next cheapest thing to do, one that you can tell it to turn the heat down when you're not home, and turn it up when you get home, turn it down at night, turn it up when you wake up, do it all automatically. And once you've got that programmable thermostat, turn the heat down in the, in the winter, turn the air conditioning down in the summer, so set your limits fairly high ranges. Look at your hot water heater. Uh, mine is gas, so that isn't going to affect my electricity at all. But this is where one possibility is to say, can I use solar hot water? Solar hot water is a system that goes usually on the roof in the sun, where the sun's heat is concentrated on water, which can then get very, very hot indeed and be stored in a tank for you to use. Hot water systems for solar are very efficient, and break-even points are on the order of five years or less. So if you've got sun on your roof, that is a sensible thing to do first. Works in the winter, too. Works amazingly well. Had one on the solar house in uh, D.C., and you opened up the door where the hot water heater was, and the heat just hit you. And they got a really good hot water heater, and they weren't using it to heat. It was just holding the hot water. And, and it was just oozing heat. It was a 70 degree day. It was sunny. It took 15 minutes to heat, um, I think 15, 20 gallons of water to 140 degrees Fahrenheit with the solar hot water heater. It was really impressive. Okay, so I'll look at my water heater, decide what to do. Then you start doing more expensive things, insulation on the walls, 
change your windows, look at the cracks around the doors, think about putting shades in to keep the sun out in the summer, put more blankets on your bed so you can turn the heats down. These kinds of things that might cost a little more. Then you look at parasitic loads. Your cell phone charger uses electricity all the time it's plugged in. It does not matter where your cell phone is. Your cell phone charger is at home plugged in, your cell phone's in your pocket, your cell phone charger is using electricity. And that applies to anything that looks like a wall ward. You'll feel it sometime, it's getting hot. So you're uh, paying Westar to warm your, your house with inductive loads. Those are things that it's good to either unplug or turn off properly if they have a um, power strip when you're not home. And one last, perhaps uh, the most expensive thing to think about is a ground source heat pump because that's using the natural heat in the ground to both cool and heat your house. You go six feet down, the temperature is something like 70 degrees or 50 degrees. So you can use water you run through pipes or air you run through pipes at the ground at that level to start there for heating and cooling. And it's, it's still going to use electricity, but it's much, much more efficient than any other way we have of changing the temperature of your house. But it's also obviously expensive. So after you've done a lot of those things, thought about how much those cost versus the solar array, then it's time to think, well, what can I do? Do I have any sun worth talking about? Okay. The amount of sun available is called irradiance. And there are a lot of web tools for figuring out what your solar irradiance is. Three tier has a free thing called first look. And rel has a thing called MB. It means in my backyard instead of not in my backyard. Um, and you go there and you say, it says, so you want to build a solar uh, array? Well, zoom in on the map, find your house, draw the solar array on your roof, and it'll tell you how big it is and eventually how much it'll cost. So it's a very useful tool. HOMER, which used to be an acronym and now doesn't mean anything, is a software tool that lets you say, I want these solar panels and this wind turbine and several other things, and how much is the whole mess going to cost me? And it, it does calculations to that effect. And then uh, Wind Navigator does just wind. Okay. It does the same thing 3-tier does, but 3-tier does solar as well. And Wind Navigator just does wind. And I think the last time I checked, 3-tier did not have wind in Kansas on it, but it does have sun. Uh, wind Navigator has wind everywhere. On it. You, you zoom in on where you are, and it'll give you a, an idea of the wind uh, resource at your location. Okay, so you've, you've decided where you live and found out how much sun you can count on. Now we've got to figure out a few details. How big an array do I want? Right now, in Kansas, this may well be different next year, it does not make sense to pay to generate your own electricity and sell back to the grid because the utilities, most of the state, there's a few exceptions, will not take your electricity at the cost they will charge you. They'll charge you eight cents, they'll pay you four. And that four varies a little bit, depending on how much they have to pay for coal. Uh, that's, that is to say, Kansas does not have net metering. Uh, they're required to pay you 150% of the cost of the coal, but that's all. So it doesn't make sense if I spend a lot of money to get to put up this array, I want it to pay for itself in electricity that it generates. And if I have it generating four cent electricity, it's going to take a lot longer to pay off. So that's why you tend to size your system, whether it's wind or solar, for something like a third of your usage. Then you must decide, are you going to run a grid connected system or you want to run for batteries? If you want to go completely off-grid and say goodbye to Westar altogether, then you've got to say, all right, how many days do I need electricity if the sun doesn't shine? You say, well, maybe I can guarantee myself electricity even if the sun doesn't shine for five days, or maybe it's three. Anyway, okay, you figure out how much energy you need in three, three sort of typical days, and that size is your batteries. Do I want to 
put in some ability to adjust the solar panel. It's easier to do if you put it on the ground. If you put it on the roof, it's kind of tough. Uh, ways to adjust it, obviously the sun is higher in the air, in the sky in the summer, so you want your array flatter. So you want the solar array, solar beams to hit that array at right angles. And then in the winter, the sun is lower in the sky, so you want the array more tilted. So one pretty good way of getting some money out of things is to arrange that you adjust it four times a year. <coughs> and just this angle, you know, that one. Obviously, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, so the other thing you might want to do is to have a rotating array that tracks the sun around. That's pretty expensive, so if you think about that. There are some really clever passive ways of doing that, where the mount that the array is on has a fluid in it that as it gets hot expands, and that pushes that side of the mount up higher and turns the panel around. And then you can kind of spring load it so when the sun sets and the whole system cools off, it automatically returns back to east. Um, but all of those, you, you can't really do that on a roof, so you have to decide if you can get away with that. And then you have to decide for yourself, how quickly do I want this thing to pay back? And both Homer and Imby will tell you. Uh, if you buy such and such a system at this electricity rate, this is how many years it'll take to pay off. And then you have to look and see what kind of incentives are available and what does the utility demand that you do. Okay. Uh, in West Star territory, they'll demand that you put a second meter so that they can measure electricity going out and coming in so they can make sure they, they don't uh, let you get the same rate to generate that you have to pay. Um, incentives in Kansas, there aren't any, except that you don't have to pay property taxes on this thing you've just bought. That's it. Uh, however, that uh, wonderful um, bill that the Congress passed before the election, the buyout bill that gives all that money to the banks, has some really good incentives, <laughs> finally, for renewable energy. And one of those is a up to $4,000 tax credit for homeowner installed renewable energy sources, including both solar and wind. And the up to 4,000 obviously depends on what your income is, as well as the cost of the system. I strongly su suspect, and everybody that I know in the renewable energy, energy in industry is pretty sure that we'll see some pretty marked changes next year. Um, and I, I think the results of the election would indicate they're more likely to come quickly than slower. However, I also think that Kansas lawmakers will continue to drag their feet and will wait for the feds to tell them what to do at this point. But things like national net metering are, are I think, a possibility, as well as an increase in electricity generated from fuel, from um, fossil fuel, so that costs go up for coal and makes it more uh, sensible to put in renewable systems. Last thing you have to do is find a dealer. Uh, there are any number of websites. In fact, it's probably so crazy it gets hard to know who to talk to. But findsolar.com is trying to keep track of, of good dealers. And you can put in your zip code, and it'll tell you who's selling systems in your area. Um, this is the <coughs> national, um, it's something like energy efficiency and renewables something. It's got a really good step-by-step -step help you out thing in there and eventually sends you to find solar, but it's a very good educational site to work your way through for both solar and wind. Okay. There is nothing stopping us doing this now except that in Kansas our electricity is too cheap. Uh, it is time we recognize that we are not paying the full cost of electricity. And did some cool things. This is the solar decathlon, I think from uh, 2007. I'm not sure, but they looked similar. And all of these little houses were designed to be purely off-grid. They use no energy, uh, no wired energy at all. They all have some form of hot water, solar hot water, and then they all have solar panels. The one thing they are not allowed to do is, is use wind. That's forbidden on this contest. Questions?
Yes, they all had battery systems as part of the design, uh, and they have to decide for themselves how much backup. But the contest requires that they work for 10 days, and they have certain things they have to do. Uh, the more battery backup, the more expensive it is. So that's all part of the, the contest figuring. It's pretty impressive. Um, our house had a wall about so wide and taller than I am, but just like that high, and then so thick. It was just solid batteries. And that was three days worth. What we figured was three days worth of energy. Uh, just out of curiosity, what, are, what is the process in obtaining like, the material needed for the cells? Like you said, it was kind of a messy process. Um, well, silicon is easy. We've got lots of that on beaches, but it's all mixed up with oxygen. It's sand. You have to heat it up a lot, very hot, um, close to 1,000 degrees Celsius, to melt it and get the oxygen out. Okay, the oxygen will leave as you melt it, so that's not too hard, but, but you've got to do that. Then you've got this huge vat of crystal and silicon, which you can then, uh, you take a seed, like if, if it was diamond, you would have a seed diamond. So you have a seed perfect crystal that you hold in this stuff, and as the, the liquid condenses gradually into a solid, you, you grow the crystal and you gradually pull it out and you get this, this big cylinder that's solid silicon. Okay, that's not that messy, but then we have to get those dopants in it. We have to put a little bit of something with too much electrons and something with too little electrons. Well, I take this log, what it looks like, of silicon, slice it in pieces so they're disks. Then stick it in an oven with the gas that I need to put in. The typical gases are phosphorus and boron, arsenic, and gallium. Arsenic isn't really healthy. The others aren't particularly either. If you want to, to dope the cell with only one thing, that's easier. But usually, you want part of the cell to be one and the other part of the cell to be something else. So I have to cover the cell with a mask, which is some sort of um, organic solvent goo stuff, which I then have to dissolve after I'm finished with it. And it's the continuous heating, washing, dissolving, painting, and doing this over again. That system has a lot of nasty solvents in it. It is exactly the same system that makes computers and cell phones and so on. So it's not like it's anything worse. And the, the whole industry has gotten a lot cleaner than it used to be. But uh, yeah, it's, it's fairly energy intensive and it has been very messy. Yeah. Pretty good. There's a, things have improved e even from, well, I think, say, for this, this decade, they are much, much better than they were in the 80s. So things have improved drastically. Um, a lot of that is dri driven by work in um, Europe, where they're required by EU regs to track cradle to grave all everything that they use. Uh, so they're, if they're going to make solar cells, if Siemens is making solar cells in Germany, which they are, they need to deal with all of the toxics. And the best way to do that is to not have any to start with. So water and orange juice are both uh, used a lot. And the industry isn't nearly as messy as it used to be. I'm out of town on Thursday the 20th, so next uh, Thursday we're here, two weeks from tonight, uh, no class, and then we'll have class the following Monday, and uh, Donald Anthony can come that day, and so that's uh, why we have that. As far as your uh, papers are concerned, uh, we'll continue working on your project topic and at the end of the semester you need to supply a written 
paper and then also make an oral presentation and uh, I would say aim for about uh, 10 minutes with respect to your oral presentation and you're welcome to use uh, PowerPoints and if you uh, bring uh, your information on a memory stick that works well uh, with this system. And so on December 11th and December 18th, uh, that's the time when we have the oral presentations and your uh, written paper and your oral presentation, uh, those are the basis for your grade. There's no uh, final exam over all of these uh, presentations, but rather for you to do a good job with your uh, topic that you're working with. So, any questions? That was yes. the date of the presentations again. The, the dates, uh, December 11th, uh, the Thursday that's a dead week, and then the uh, Thursday following that, uh, December 18th, so we, we go back to our 7 o'clock Thursday night for uh, both presentation times. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Did everybody get a copy?